This is the video for book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. Like all the videos I'll record for all of the readings, this is not going to cover every important topic in the reading. It's actually not going to cover most of the important topics of the reading. That's what the reading quiz is for. The quiz directs you to the important parts of the reading. Even the quiz leaves some things out, but it's relatively comprehensive. This video is to cover topics that you probably cannot get just by reading the text closely. It covers some background knowledge to have in mind while you're reading the text, before you read the text, or uh, after you read the text. And so this is more of a supplement than a summary. The job of making a summary is for you, and the job of thinking about all the important topics is for you and us in the class. This video is just a supplement. So in this video, we're going to cover three topics, uh, the notion of happiness, the notion of humans as social creatures, and uh, the idea of souls in Aristotle. So the first topic, happiness. So happiness is the subject of book one. Book one is almost entirely about happiness. And happiness is an English word. It's the word our translation uses to translate a Greek word, eudaimonia, which you can see there on the screen, written uh, in English transliteration and then in the original Greek uh, letters. And so eudaimonia is, happiness is not a perfect translation for eudaimonia. Uh, there's no English word that is a perfect translation for eudaimonia. Happiness is what our translation goes with. Other translations go with something like flourishing or blessedness something like this. The word eudaimonia, sort of its etymology, its original literal meaning uh, is from two parts, eu and daimon or daimonia. So eu is the Greek prefix for good. So if you think about uh, euphoria, a kind of good feeling, or like a, a eulogy, uh, good things you say about dead people, or uh, eugenics, like good genes, uh, the, the word eu means good there. And then daimon, or daimonia, is uh, where we get the English word demon. It's a sort of uh, supernatural power, uh, kind of like a lesser god or a minor god. And so the idea of being eudaimon is sort of, there's like a, there's like a good god watching over you, somebody uh, sort of taking care of you, looking out for you in your life. And so the sort of original notion of eudaimonia was, oh, being blessed or being uh, protected by a benevolent god for you. And so that's not what Aristotle means. Aristotle doesn't mean happiness or eudaimonia is being watched over by a divine power. But that's the sort of sense which it develops from, which is, oh, your life is sort of going well. Somebody, like, not literally, but it's as if somebody's looking out for you. Uh, things are going good for you. Uh, you're flourishing. Uh, you're succeeding. Uh, your you know, life is good. The reason happiness is not a perfect term for this is that in English, happiness is a very sort of limited thing, the way we usually use it. Happiness is like an internal feeling, and it's a pleasant sort of feeling. You can be happy one day and sad the next day. You can be happy one minute and sad the next minute. Maybe just a mood comes over you. Happiness is like a pleasurable feeling. Uh, it's a sort of psychological thing. And so eudaimonia is much more than just this kind of happiness. It's much less fleeting than this kind of happiness. So you can't be eudaimonia one moment and lose it the next moment. No, it's this sort of thing that lasts throughout your life. Happiness, or eudaimonia, in Aristotle's sense, is uh, not just like a feeling you have. It's a state that you're in. It's an objective state that you're in. And so everybody can sort of look at you and see that you are eudaimon. It's not like it's just this internal thing going on inside your head like the English term happiness. So if we take a look at Aristotle talking about happiness or eudaimonia when it first comes up, um, let's see. So this will be on page five. He says, most people, I should think, agree with what it is called and it is the chief good. Since both the masses and sophisticated people call it happiness understanding being happy as equivalent to living well and acting well. So happiness for Aristotle is the chief good, and what does it consist of? It's living well and acting well. And then as he points out, they, so everybody, 
disagree about substantive conceptions of happiness, the masses giving an account which differs from that of the philosophers, and then most of the rest of this book, uh, by book I mean book one, not the whole Nicomachean Ethics, but book one, most of the rest of this book is about Aristotle coming up with his conception of happiness or his conception of eudaimonia. So the specifics, you'll have to read the book, but the broad outline is it's the chief good, number one, and it's equivalent to living well and acting well. So again, in English, is happiness equivalent to living well and acting well? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I can be happy even if maybe I don't live as well as I could. Maybe I don't act as well as I could. Maybe I'm kind of a jerk, but I'm still very happy. So happiness is not a perfect translation. So that's number one to keep in mind, which is happiness, when you see it in the book, don't just read it as the English happiness. Read it as eudaimonia, living well and acting well, the chief good, whatever that means. And book one is about this. That's point number one. Point number two is this thing that Aristotle says about humans as sort of social creatures um, or social animals. So if we go to page 11 in the reading, uh, he makes this point uh, about how happiness is uh, self-sufficient. And one of the things he says about self-sufficiency is that um, what we're interested in is not a person living on his own, living a solitary life, but to a person living alongside his parents, children, wife, and friends and fellow citizens generally, since a human being is by nature a social being. So this notion, the human being is by nature a social being, is very important for Aristotle. Some conceptions of human beings have us as sort of individuals. We're primarily individuals and sort of the way to understand a human is to understand the individual human in isolation. And then the way to understand social situations is to imagine a bunch of separate human beings put together. Aristotle rejects this picture of human nature. Aristotle thinks humans are by nature social creatures. Isolation is very unnatural for humans. You cannot understand what a human is by looking at them in isolation because by nature the human is not isolated. By nature the human is among other humans. And so this isn't going to, I mean, this is going to be important. It's, he doesn't often refer directly to this, but this is animating a lot of what Aristotle has in mind about how the world works, how to approach understanding human beings, how to approach understanding ethics. And so this is just one of those things to keep in the back of your mind, not just for book one, but going forward through the rest of the Nicomachean ethics, this notion that Aristotle doesn't think we're sort of isolated from each other in any real sense. Aristotle thinks that the essence of a human, the nature of a human, is to be in a social group with other humans. And uh, that's sort of what we truly are at the uh, fundamental basis. And then finally, there's some discussion of souls in uh, this book. So this comes up on page 13 of the reading. I skipped way past it. So this comes up various places in the reading. I think page 13 is when he talks the most about souls. And so he's talking about goods and things like this. And he says, goods have been classified into three groups, those called external goods, goods of the soul and goods of the body. Goods of the soul are the ones we call most strictly and most especially good, and the actions of activities of the soul we may attribute to the soul. Our conception of happiness then is plausible, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then he talks a bit more about the soul uh, in the rest of this chapter and in the book. And so when you read soul, uh, there's lots of things that you might have in mind. There's lots of understandings of the soul or souls all around the world and various religions have various conceptions of the soul and things like this. What we want to be clear on is Aristotle's understanding of the soul. And for Aristotle, the soul is a very kind of non-metaphysical thing. It's a very non-religious sort of thing. The soul is what uh, animates the body effectively. The soul is what is responsible for something being alive so it's in virtue of having a soul that uh, you can sort of grow and develop and live and eventually die. 
And so uh, the soul is what sort of animates you and moves you. If you didn't have a soul, you would be a sort of inanimate thing, like a rock. Plants have souls because they grow and they live and they die. Animals have souls because they grow and they live and they die and they move around. And humans have souls because we grow and we live and we move around and we die. There are different kinds of souls. The soul that the plant has is not a very impressive soul. The plant doesn't move around very much. Humans have very impressive souls. We can do all sorts of things with our souls. There's lots of things humans can do that other animals can't do. Uh, but ultimately, this is just what the soul is for Aristotle. It's the sort of animating force, the life force within a being. So what this means is that there's not a lot of other stuff attached to the soul. When you hear about the soul, you shouldn't be thinking about afterlife or reincarnation or divinities or anything metaphysical like this. For Aristotle, the soul is the animating principle of the body. And so it's a relatively minimal thing. It's a relatively non-religious thing. And uh, you don't want to sort of confuse yourself into thinking there's more going on with the soul than there actually is. So those are three topics to keep in mind while reading book one and to keep in mind sort of for the rest of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics.